in a storage room. Uh, they were hidden in a corner, uh, piled behind my water softener and a bunch of boxes so that they weren't visible. Um, you know, they weren't secured in a you know lock and key situation, but they were secure as far as I felt. They had no ammo around them or anything like that. Again, I don't think either weapon had been fired for 20 or 25 years. Greg out of High River with a great story. We've been telling you from the beginning, don't believe the Mounties when they say they only took, they only took firearms in plain sight, you know, on, on counters and on beds, because we've been hearing from the beginning that they also took firearms that were hidden. Well, as we listen to the RCMP explain what hidden means, check out while Greg shows us where his rifles that the RCMP took from his home actually were. It could be in, in plain view, it could be under a bed, in a closet, on top of a, uh, a place where somebody uh, could hide, you know, like upon searching uh, for people, uh, if, they, if they see a firearm that is in a closet, maybe if you stand in the middle of the room, you would say it's not in plain sight, but a as soon as you open the closet door, it becomes in plain sight. In a basement, in a closet, behind a stack of boxes, inside a locked home, is in plain sight, according to the RCMP. Solomon Friedman, our friend, regular contributor, joins us now to talk about this. And Solomon, as a, as a lawyer, as a firearms law expert, what do you say uh, to, to the RCMP spokeswoman there saying, oh, that's in plain sight? Well, I think it's, you know, what anyone who's dealt with this area for a long time knows Gun control is never about the guns, it's about the control. You had the RCMP here going door to door, really it now appears completely on a pretext because aside from those firearms that weren't in plain view, we're hearing about homes that weren't even the subject of flood damage. But th this injured. one here, not flooded at all. And I, I think in some ways that's even you know, more troubling here. I mean, the RCMP claimed we went around to secure firearms. Now, when they had to fall back from that because they have no authority to do that, then they said, well, we're looking for survivors or, or, or the dead. Well, what were you doing looking for survivors in a home that had not been flooded? But, you know, it, it's quite troubling. You know, this, this cannot end here. Canadians need to know, where did this come from? Who ultimately gave this order? This wasn't one officer or two officers or even 20 officers. There was a concerted policy to go door to door to, fire, to identify firearms owners and seize their lawful property. That is disturbing. Uh, we have been asking those questions from the beginning, and uh, we pushed to the point where there is a, an investigation by the RCMP commissioner of complaints. I'm a little worried about whether that is enough, uh, but it's underway, and we've encouraged people to, uh, to take part in that. But uh, this is, uh, I, I think it has, and we'll show this in the next two clips, I think the actions of the RCMP has soured relations. They've soured relations with local residents. Here's a couple of them and, and their description of what the Mounties did um, essentially mucking up and destroying their property in their own home. They smashed, smashed up a door, door that was worth about $600 and I walked down, made a terrible mess of my rug. We had to throw it out. I have no idea what they were looking for because it was an RCMP that evacuated me in the front of a payloader. The, the RCMP the RCMP evacuated that man and still decided they had to go through. We heard from others saying the same thing. Uh, the RCMP knew that I was out, but they still decided to bust down the door and, and march through the house. Uh, what redress do these individuals have? Beyond the Complaints Commission, can there be lawsuits? I mean, we know from experience that suing the police is often a fruitless venture. The police have both civil and criminal protections that allows them to act in the course of their duty. But I think what this case does really more than any other is to reinforce that the civil liberties of firearms owners are the civil liberties of all citizens. That if we have a situation where the RCMP can go willy-nilly, door-to-door, seizing firearms, confiscating property, they're not going to hesitate to do it where there, where there aren't firearms involved. And we see here forced evacuations and, more troublingly, property damage really with, with seemingly no justification. And... and uh, it you mentioned the civil rights of firearms owners, or the rights of all of us. It's a bit like free speech. Uh, you don't have to agree with what someone's saying. You don't have to agree with firearms owners. But if you don't stand up for the rights of your fellow citizen, eventually your rights will be abrogated as well, and who will stand up for you? And I think w without a doubt here, right, there, there's, there's no question that firearms owners were wronged, but so were ordinary residents who did not own firearms whether it was by the draconian evacuation policies or by the search and seizure tactics of, of the RCMP. 
But I, I think what it, it's very important to understand, how did we get to this point? And when, we, when it comes to gun owners, we got to this point because we accepted the criminalization of firearms owners. We gave that power to police. We put that power in the criminal code. The only way this is going to change is not through lawsuits, and it's not going to change through the RCMP Complaint Commission. It's going to change because people decide to pressure their politicians into changing the laws that enables this kind of behavior. Get, get rid of the criminalization of firearms possession. That's well, right. Legal firearms possession. That's we're, right. We're not talking about bank robbers here. No, you commit a crime with a firearm or you're prohibited by a court from possessing firearms and you possess firearms. Well, that should be the arena of the criminal law. But you are a law-abiding citizen who commits no other crime but to possess an item for lawful use. That should not be a criminal offense without government permission. And, and that, that requires a big lobbying effort and an attempt to change the law. That's underway right now? That is. That's, it's been underway for years. But what we're seeing now is as the abuses become more flagrant, in, in, in my view, what ha what's happening now is that effort is absolutely speeding up because people are just getting sick and tired. All right. Solomon Friedman, good speaking to you as always. Share your thoughts with us on this and let us know what you're doing to help change the law. Byline at sunmedia.ca.